Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. Let's take a look at chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Zechariah. The whole book of Zechariah is about the 70th week of Daniel, the last seven years of the age leading up to the appearing of Jesus and his, the bringing of his kingdom the establishing of his kingdom on earth. You may know that by now, but if not, you'll find that pretty cool. It's all about the 70th week of Daniel. This short study looks at two sister chapters that are supposed to be taught together, Zechariah 4 and Zechariah 5. Once you understand what the theme is, in Zechariah 4 and you understand the theme of Zechariah 5 then it all makes sense and you'll have a greater understanding of these two chapters than ever before. See brothers and sisters during the fifth seal during the fifth seal period which starts at the uh, event called the abomination of desolation in Jerusalem you can read about that in Matthew 24 and Daniel 11, 29 through 35. During the fifth seal, when the 42 months of great tribulation begins, the fifth seal is about the first year and some days of the entire 42 months. Now, God's judgment doesn't come until the scroll is opened about a year and some days later. But the 42 month period doesn't end until the seventh trumpet. But what you got to remember when studying these two chapters is the early days of the Great Tribulation, that fifth seal period, Israel is going to get tested. Are they going to pass the test so Father doesn't have to bring the curse when the scroll is opened? Or are they going to fail the test? In other words, Elijah mentioned in Malachi 4 is unsuccessful in his first mission in regards to turning the uh, the people of Israel back to Father Yah and his son Jesus. If Elijah is unsuccessful, then when the scroll is open, the curse gets unleashed on Israel and the world, and judgment begins with the house of God Israel. But during the fifth seal period, Israel is going to be tested. They are going to receive wicked counsel and wonderful counsel, and then they'll have to decide, is this man of sin, son of perdition, king of Assyria, the Bible calls him, who comes forth from Al-Mazil, Iraq, says Nahum 1 verse 11. Um, do they accept him as their Messiah or not? Now they'll receive wicked counsel from not only the man of sin himself, but his false prophet, and also the image that shall speak, that you're going to see in this short study. It's a woman's voice. Uh, being spoken by this basket of wickedness set on its base in the house prepared for it in the land of Shinar, Baghdad. You're going to see all of that in just these two chapters. So, again, Israel will receive wicked counsel from those three, and Israel will receive good, wonderful counsel from the two witnesses as well as Christians who are being um, captured and brought in and interrogated and tortured and persecuted and many killed for their faith. Why won't they stop causing trouble for the new Messiah? Because he is possessed by Satan. But you get my point. Once you understand that that's what these two chapters are about, the good counsel in chapter 4 and the wicked counsel in chapter 5, resulting in Israel and the world having to undergo the curse. Now, the Lord is coming not only to test Israel, but to test all who dwell on the earth, right? We get that from Revelation 3. He comes to test all who dwell on the earth. This is Father's way of marking individuals, either on their forehead or on their right hand, those who worship the beast. These people will receive the mark thinking it's a good thing. And it's really Father's way to identify them so that the reaping angels and uh, all the weapons of indignation of Jesus 
will be able to cast out all who offend and expel all who offend Father Yah. All of this within these two chapters. So again, Zechariah 4 is about the wonderful counsel, the good counsel that Israel shall receive. And Zechariah 5 is primarily about the wicked counsel that Israel will receive as well as the resulting curse uh, that's going to be used by Father to not only test Israel but the entire world so that Father can expel or cast out all who offend at the seventh bowl battle of the great day of God Almighty. So here we go. Zechariah 4 and 5, two sister chapters, both about the 70th week of Daniel. The whole book of Zechariah is about the 70th week of Daniel. Sorry about uh, the size of this picture here. Um, I didn't mean for it to be so small, so obviously you're not going to be able to see this on a on a cell phone, smartphone, you're going to have to use a desktop monitor and you're going to have to save it as a picture and I'll leave you the link and you could zoom into it or you could just read in your own Bibles and just listen to me. Alright, so I, uh, I have here above Zechariah 4, that's the left block, verses 1 through 14, this is the good counsel. Over here, this is Zechariah 5, verses 1 through 11. This is the evil counsel and the resulting curse. Let's start with Zechariah 4, verse 1, vision of the lampstand and olive trees. Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? Sounds like Jeremiah, doesn't it? Sounds like Amos. What do you see? So I said, I am looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and on the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. And it's interesting that these are actually people when you get down to verse 10. Now, in verse 3, it switches gears, and now it's talking about the two olive trees. These, these, When we get down here, we see these are also two people. These are the two witnesses who begin their testimony 30 days following the abomination of desolation. And they will testify to the truth and give wonderful counsel all the way up to their death at the uh, seventh trumpet period. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. Okay, And we see down here the two anointed ones. Verse 4, So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these? Referring to the uh, seven lamps, the stand seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Is that talking about the uh, beast kingdom at the end of the age? Absolutely. And Zerubbabel is going to be brought back to life and be used to help Jesus lay the foundation of the fourth temple, the millennial temple. And it brings Father and Son Jesus pleasure, all right, to bring Zerubbabel back and let him finish what he started but it'll be the fourth temple before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace grace to it moreover the word of the Lord came to me saying the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple his hands shall also finish it 
Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. There's a lot of then you will know scriptures in the Bible. You see them at the end, typically, of passages that are about the 70th week of Daniel. That's where you'll find them, chapters like Ezekiel 38 and 39, then you will know. If you've never noticed that before, that's always a clue to you that we're talking about the 70th week of Daniel. When the kingdom comes, Jesus appears, and the day, the battle of the great day of God Almighty, Jesus appears in glory. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven up here rejoice to see uh, the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel, talking about immortal Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. And you might say, they're not people. Oh, they are, just like these are, are people. And they, the people, rejoice. Right? This is a, a human action. This is what humans do. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But the seven, these represent the seven shepherds. And I've got the uh, scripture references up here for you. And it's, talk, and it's dealing with the return of Jesus Christ and the uprooting of the beast kingdom and the establishment of the kingdom of heaven. But these are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he said, These are the two anointed ones. See, ones, we're talking about people who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth and do what? Give good counsel. They should be listened to. And also, they can uh, do more than just give good counsel. They can make your life miserable. That's the two witnesses. Uh, look at, looking at my notes over here on the left, this, uh, these passages, especially dealing with the seven who rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel, immortal Zerubbabel, uh, match, this is the match to Micah 5.5, 5, Isaiah 13, 1 through 6. You learn more about those who rejoice at my exaltation during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. In Zechariah 1.20, the My Mighty Ones, consisting of seven shepherds from the Judeo-Christian nations, will wait on the seventh trumpet to come to be used by Jesus as part of his weapons of indignation. They will use modern technology from the four craftsmen defense contractors. So you know, I got to know a little bit about the four craftsmen and the seven shepherds and eight priestly men. And how they're going to be used by Jesus to uproot the beast kingdom at the end of the age. So you got to know a little bit about that for this really to, uh, to even make sense to you. But uh, make sure you understand Isaiah 13, 3b. And that will begin to help your understanding of, of the rejoicing of these seven. Also down here uh, about the two witnesses. Match to Revelation 11, verses 11 through 12. That's the match. The two witnesses, Elijah and Moses, stand on their feet. They give good counsel. So here we are, verses 11 and 12 of Zechariah 4, being the match to Revelation 11, 11 and 12, dealing with the two witnesses. Okay? The numbers match. That doesn't always prove anything. But here... It, it, they do go together. We should take notice that 11 and 12 of Revelation 11 is 11 and 12 of Zechariah 4. Hallelujah. Let's look at the sister chapter, Zechariah 5. This again is about the evil council. Uh, and then also it starts off talking about Father's plan. 
to test all who dwell on the earth and use the curse of the mark of the beast to uh, to mark those who need to be consumed at the coming of Jesus Christ. Alleluia. But we're going to start off in verse 2 with me making a guess. So the understanding of verse 2, I've got a guess. And if you know what it is, please let me know. Zechariah 5, 1 through 11, vision of the flying scroll. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? Right? Remember the what do you see over here in the sister chapter? We also have the what do you see in verse 2. See how these go together, brothers and sisters. They should never be taught separately. And again, these when what do you see questions by God to his prophets are always concerning the 70th week. Don't fight it. Thank the Lord for his, his help, his clues. Amos 8 comes to mind. Um, uh, Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 1, comes to mind. All right, Don't fight it. He's letting you know, hey, I'm talking about the last days and the bringing of the kingdom. So I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. So when the Bible gives you that kind of specificity, he means it. So we can't deny that whatever this flying scroll is, its length is 20 cubits by 10 cubits. Now when you do the math and you turn it into feet, you do the conversion, it's 30 feet by 15 feet. So whatever this flying scroll is, is 30 feet by 15 feet. And, it, and we keep reading, we see that it has something to do with this testing all who dwell on the earth. You got to keep that in the back of your mind when you're trying to figure out what this flying scroll is. It's something used like a decree to demand worship. And he said to me, what do you see? So I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Now I understand that when the Bible gives you the answer to your question, you should teach that as the answer and you shouldn't try to make guesses. But, and I totally agree with you. All right? But sometimes we don't get the complete understanding just by using what the Bible says is the answer. Okay? This is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Now, if you just said, okay, that's what it is, and you moved on, you're not giving full understanding. You're not. Because this sucker, this thing, is 30 feet by 15 feet. This flying scroll. And just to say, well, it's a curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. And that's the only understanding you give? All right? And you might say, well, that's all the Lord gave us. Well, I see your point. But it doesn't hurt to try to say what some possibilities are of that that this curse might be that's 30 feet by 15 feet. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm not betting the farm that this is right. I'm just saying as of today, this is one possibility. But remember, it has to do with testing those who dwell on the earth. And if you fail the test, you're going to be consumed and cast out of the Lord's kingdom at the coming of Jesus. Remember that. you got to pass the test. Remember what all of Revelation tells us about what happens to those who take the mark of the beast and bow before his image. All right? So this thing that's flying is a decree that's demanding worship, whatever it is. Right? It's demanding worship. So my best guess to date is it's a banner that's being pulled by some type of aircraft. Now, here's some things you got to consider. The aircraft has to be able to fly low enough so people can read the decree that's on this flying scroll. That's 30 feet by 15 feet. It's flying. 
They've got to be able to read it. It's demanding worship. Uh, if you don't do this, you're going to die. That's my guess. So, you know, a traditional little cup plane is, I don't think that banner is going to be long enough for people on the ground to see it or even on a mountaintop to, to be able to read it. So that's why I said a drone pulled beast banner. My best guess to date. Give it some thought, see what you think. But it's not in real important on whether I'm right about it being a, a banner pulled by a drone because it's only 30 feet by 15 feet. What's important is, is that you understand that this thing is part of the test of Revelation 3, right? And he's demanding worship. That's what all this counsel is about, good counsel and bad counsel. Is the king of Assyria that comes forth from Mosul, is he the true Messiah of the world or not? That's what this is all about. All right, let's move on. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll. And we know from Revelation what that means. And we know from Matthew 13 what that means. And every perjurer shall be expelled, right? Cast out according to that side of it. I will send out the curse. Father's trying to identify who is it that has... Uh, Satan uh, their, as their father, or has the spirit of their father, the devil. Who are these people who are going to rebel, who love lawlessness, who love to rebel, don't like being told what to do, who quickly will run to false gods? These people have to be removed before Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom. Or they're going to give them and their seed line are going to give Jesus a hard time for the next thousand years. I will, this is Father talking, I, he's the Lord of hosts. I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts. And we see in Revelation what seal, trumpet, or bowl he sends out the curse. And you might say, oh, that's, that's when the scroll is open. Well, yes. But if the Antichrist starts demanding worship during the fifth seal before the scroll is open, you can say the curse has been unleashed because he's demanding worship. And in other words, if the mark of the beast gets implemented during the fifth seal, then you could say the testing begins during the fifth seal. But it depends on is the curse the casting out of everyone from all the nations who offend or is this chapter specifically talking about those who take the mark of the beast from from the nation of Israel because in that sense um, the curse in other words if you do this you're blessed if you do this you're cursed they'll receive judgment or the judgment of the curse when the scroll is open does that make sense so the curse is like the punishment of failing the test. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. All right. That's the thief and the perjurer. That's what Father is doing. He's identifying the thieves. He's identifying the perjurers. And he wants to make sure that they are cast out of his kingdom when Jesus comes to fight the battle of the great day of God Almighty. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it. So you may stay, you may get the mark of the beast and stay alive all the way up to Jesus' coming. Doesn't matter. <laughs> you and probably everyone in your house is going to be destroyed. Now, I say everyone in your house, only Father knows. Obviously, if there's Christians in there, then they're going to get glorified at Jesus' coming. Now, here we go. Let's talk about this image that shall speak. Vision of the woman in a basket. And you may not get the correct understanding of this if you don't even realize that we're talking about the, the testing that's going on during the 70th week of Daniel. That Once you understand that, then you start seeing that, oh, this is that image that shall speak. 
Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, Lift your eyes now and see what this is that goes forth. Right? The, the scroll was demanding worship. Goes forth. This image goes forth. And then it's going to be set down on its base in the house that's going to be prepared for it. It even tells you the city where this basket will be set on its base. This image with a woman's voice giving wicked counsel. So it is a basket that is, well, I just want to pause for a second. I'm trying to think if I want to talk more about the going forth. Um, no, let's keep reading. Lift your eyes now and see what this is that goes forth. So I asked, what is it? And he said, it is a basket. Sounds innocent, doesn't it? It is a basket that is going forth. Well, what's a basket used for? A basket is used for harvesting the fruit. Right? At harvest time, you bring food into the basket. And you take it to the storage location. Well, this false messiah is going to try to convince the world that he's going to solve all their problems and he's going to ensure that everyone has more food around the world than they possibly need. All right, that's people's number one need is food. Right? And it's in other words, hey, in my kingdom, no one's going to starve. That's going to be one of his messages. It is a basket that is going forth. He also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. And now he tells us, here is a lead disc lifted up, and this is a woman sitting inside of the basket. This isn't a literal woman. Then he said, and this has something to do with the harlot, all right? The harlot that rides the beast. And during the 70th week of Daniel, then he said, this is wickedness. And that's referring to uh, millions are going to be deceived by this. Whatever this is, millions are going to be deceived by it. And it's going to give wicked counsel, right? We see the good counsel over here. Then he said, this is wickedness. Not, I mean, this is pure wickedness. This is satanic. And thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. All right. And, and, and the, the mouth of the basket is mentioned for a reason. Right. Giving wicked counsel. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between the earth and the heaven. You don't have to lift a basket up very high to be considered between earth and heaven. It just means off the ground. Okay. Now... Picture this. This is a woman's voice in this basket of wickedness. These are women, right? Looking like they have wings transporting it. Um, this is a ceremony. You see, what I'm, this is a ceremony that's going to be watched by the world. So whether it's just uh, two women, one behind the other, with a pole on their left shoulders and a pole on their right shoulders. And this basket that gives wicked counsel is not that heavy. We, we're not given its dimensions. And it can be transported like the Olympic torch, maybe, from wherever it's created. could be created in Israel. I have no idea. Or it could be created in Baghdad, and then just they're going to walk it to the house that's prepared for it. You need to be thinking about the Kabbalah in Mecca and the black stone. Kabbalah being the house made for the black stone. Well, this is going to be a house, and we see it down here in verse 11. Okay. 
that's going to be made for this basket that's going to be set there in the house on its base. Right? This is a beautiful ceremony using lots of women. Maybe the women carrying it will actually have fake wings. Like a Hollywood production. Could be. Or it could be. I mean, you could just let your mind wonder. Maybe these two women have female names on the Chinook helicopters. And it's two Chinook helicopters transporting this very heavy lead basket. You see what I mean? Two. It's house in the city of the land of Shinar. Let's go ahead and finish reading this. And he thrust her down into the basket through the lead cover over its mouth. Then I raised my eyes and looked. And there were two women coming with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the basket between the earth and the heaven. This is going to be a big event, a big ceremony for the world when this happens. But it's pure evil. Kind of like what we see coming out of Hollywood today. So I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? The Lord wants you to know where, what city on the planet this basket that's going to give wicked counsel, it shall speak with a woman's voice. It's going, it, the Bible here in verse 11 tells you the city you don't have to guess. It's not Manhattan, it's not Rome, it's not Moscow, it's not Istanbul, it's not Jerusalem, it's Baghdad. And he said to me to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. When it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base in this house. When it is ready. Are you listening? This is a fifth seal event. All right, you should be thinking like Daniel 11.39. This is an event and a decree that's going to be used to advance and acknowledge the beast kingdom. Now let's check out my notes concerning Zechariah 5. The curse is the contents of the scroll that Jesus will open. It is judgment day that will last around three years. Get that from Isaiah 20 and Isaiah 16. Everyone who offends father and son will be cast out, right, expelled from the land of the living. They will not get to enter the millennial reign of Christ. They will suffer for eternity. Pay attention to Revelation chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. Father will permit the dragon and the Antichrist to create an image that speaks using a female voice to give wicked counsel. That's what's meant by a woman being thrust down into the basket. It's going to give a female voice. It will be placed in Baghdad, the land of Shinar. This harvest image, that's what I'm calling it, will seem wonderful. Right? No more starvation on planet Earth. Everyone's going to share the oil and gas revenue. Right? This is the king of Assyria that comes forth from Mosul. Gog the Assyrian taking over the Persian Gulf, taking over the eastern Mediterranean Sea, oil and gas fields, oil and gas refineries. He's taking away the precious metals down the Nile River Basin from Egypt and Ethiopia and Sudan. He's just, and he's taken over the trade routes of the Red Sea. He's just taken over everything, and he's convincing the world it's a wonderful thing because I can do miracles, I am God, and I'm going to make sure everybody eats. What do you think, brothers and sisters? I'm curious. But one thing I am completely sure of, this is all about the 70th week of Daniel. If you don't see that, then you're not going to get the correct understanding. Good counsel versus wicked counsel. What are you going to do, Israel? Are you going to be blessed or are you going to be cursed? All right, brothers and sisters, let's end this short study on Zechariah 4 and 5. I hope it's been a blessing to you. And I can't wait to see you again.